a single scream in the darkness of a leafy West London street. It was the only sound heard, but that single scream heralded a horrific crime. It was an awful scene for, for the people to be confronted with. And when police arrived there, it, it was absolute carnage. A crime so catastrophic and shocking that it would shatter the lives of the innocent victims drawn into it. We were in limbo. We didn't know why this was happening to us. That was the start of our nightmare that we're still living in. A nightmare which took the victim's family and the police into a dark and twisted world, ruled by an obsessive jealousy. Because of the ferocious nature of the attack, we weren't going to take any chances. Um, it was fair to say we went in hard. Police! 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 But the killer was cunning, determined to plan every move and to hide at every turn. Determined to get away with murder. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Southall, a bustling multicultural suburb of West London. A heartland for Indian families like the Shins, who raised their five children there their three sons and two daughters, Anita and Geeta. It's quite clear that Geeta and her family are well-liked, well-loved and well-respected in the Southall community. Geeta was really popular. She had a lot of friends. She was academically really good. She loved art. With her, everything was just solved with a smile. We just have to look at her and just start laughing. I, I, I can't ever say, hand on heart, that I've had an argument with Geeta ever. The closest the two sisters would ever come was over Geeta's passion for all things Bollywood. <laughs> what are you doing? Come on. Join the meeting. Wherever the celebrities were, the Bollywood stars, it was guaranteed that we'd be there. Me and her, she used to drag me along, by the way. <laughs> two, three, four. See, that was really good. Geeta left school in 1997 with A's and B's in her GCSEs, and although she continued her education, she was desperate to get out into the working world. She did really well in her GCSEs. Academically, she was really bright. She was doing a work experience course where she was studying and getting experience at the same time with a really big air freight company. A year later, whilst she was on her way to work at the freight company, Geeta met a young man called Harpreet Orlak. Hey, go. Who was also known as Sonny. Sonny came over the country and he immediately disappeared into the, the Southall community. Um, and it was a bus stop in Southall where he first met Geeta. Uh, and the two of them got on. Hey, what's your name? Come on. Just your name, that's all I'm asking for. It was a couple of meetings and I think they got talking and they always used to bump into each other on the same route. That's how they met. <laughs> but Anita wasn't overly impressed when Geeta confided in her that she had started seeing Sonny. He was well known as a troublemaker. Everyone knew of him. Didn't even know who I was. He had a big reputation in Southall, but that was really from his own mouth, perpetuated by him, really. He was no master criminal. He was no big gangster, no big drug dealer. He was a, a low-level villain who survived by the exploitation of others. <laughs> she had seen his face. Didn't know what hit him. <laughs> we all knew that he was in a gang, and we knew when he used to drink, you know, his mouth used to get away with him. And meeting Sonny in the flesh didn't improve her opinion. I met him at a party, that was my first uh, memory of meeting him and I took an instant dislike to him. He was clearly quite drunk and he kept on popping to the gents and every time he came out his behaviour seemed more and more erratic and with these bloodshot eyes and I kind of got an idea of what he was up to and what he was about because I was asking him questions and I, was get, I wasn't getting any direct answers. He was just 
avoiding just simple subjects just like where you're from, what you do. Sunny failed to make a good impression on Anita, but her little sister was head over heels in love. Gita was keen, but at a young age, you know, you're naive, you're vulnerable, think you're in love, I guess. Our worries were normal when it came to my sister, like, why don't you work, why don't you go and get a job? Rather than wanting to be a lad, wanting to go out, Gita could have done a lot better. But Gita disagreed and quickly moved in with Sunny. It seemed like the bright, smiley girl was slipping away from the family. We try to approach her, but he wouldn't let us. We wanted to meet her, but we had to phone him. We had to ask for his permission to speak to Gita. When the family tried to see Gita, Sonny was always present and would do all the talking. Oh. And his talk soon turned to marriage. We did say to my sister, you know, and Sonny, that what is the hurry? I mean, she was still so young and getting married at a young age. There was just no need for it. But he had this sense of urgency about him. Because we're in love, that's the rush. My family, we were like, you know what, come back home and we'll do it the proper way. We'll get you married in a temple. But Gita didn't listen. They um, went away and didn't tell us when they got married. She was so young. She had the rest of her life ahead of her. We couldn't understand why they wanted to get married in such a hurry. The couple eloped to Belgium, an act that would ultimately shatter the lives of everyone involved. The year was 2000, and 20-year-old Gita Shin and her 22-year-old boyfriend, Harpreet Orlak, who was also known as Sunny, had eloped to Belgium. After they married, the couple moved to Holland and had a baby son, but Gita was feeling guilty. She wrote us a letter. It was addressed to my mum and dad, apologising for what she had done. But the letter did not include any contact details. Although Gita's family were desperate for her to come home, they had no way to tell her. Then we got a phone call from Sunny saying, you know, she's depressed without you lot. And my mum was like, well, book her a flight ASAP, basically. So she came to England and stayed with us for about a month. Now back in touch with her family, more visits followed. And in 2001, Gita's parents made a suggestion. My parents were like, come back and come back for good. You know, we're a family and we'll support you, which we did. They stayed with us for about a month. And then my mum and dad got them a flat. And my dad tried to get Sonny into employment, asked around for jobs but it seemed Sonny was not interested in working. I think from all the years that I knew Sonny, he was in employment twice. You know, he had this attitude that, oh, I'm, I'm rich in India, so uh, why should I work here? He didn't support his family. He was more interested in hanging out with his friends, drinking, doing all sorts. When to us, your number one priority should have been your family. Simple as. Gita and Sunny had a second son in 2002. And supporting her family by going back to work was Gita's priority. She was raising her children, but she still went out to work supporting her family, whilst Sunny would just laze around the house all day. She worked in a solicitor's office. She worked in the travel agents. And finally, she found the job of her dreams. She was a receptionist at Sunrise Radio. This was the job she always wanted. In 2006, 24-year-old Gita started working as a receptionist at Southall's Sunrise Radio, Britain's first independent 24-hour Asian station. With Bollywood stars frequently passing through its studios, it was the perfect job for Gita. We used to go there as youngsters, whenever they used to be Bollywood celebs, and she'd go crazy. And she actually ended up working at that radio station. And she just loved it. It was uh, really good seeing her almost back to how she was as a teenager. It gave her almost like a new lease of life. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. OK, bye. But although Gita loved her new job, her home life was increasingly unhappy. 
a deep rift was opening between Gita and Sonny. I'm the man, that's why. He would phone her up to see where she was, what she was doing. He would tell her not to wear certain clothes. At certain times, he would tell her not to go out with her friends. It was a psychological abuse which breaks down people's confidence and breaks down their ability to go out into public, to meet the friends and to have a proper life. Get out of my sight, you make me sick. She didn't want this life. She just wanted some normality. Um, she didn't want a husband that came in early doors, drunk. Um, being abusive. I said, look at me. Listen to me. On one occasion, Sonny's anger became so intense that Gita called the police. Hey! I said, I come here, now! There were times he did lose his temper with my sister. She had rang the police um, Give me that phone. when he had been physically abusive to her. Hello? Please, what? please. Why are you overreacting? Determined to try to hold things together, she refused to file a formal complaint. Yeah, I just wanted to stop behaving like he's doing. Even if we ask, you know, are you okay? Is everything all right at home? She'll just smile it off, brush it off with a smile. I think to her, she had made her bed and she was just lying in it, basically. But by 2009, after nine years of marriage, Gita had finally had enough. So she finally plucked up the courage and was like, you know what, I'm not going to be taken in by you anymore. And um, that's when she told him that she wants a divorce. With the news his marriage was over, Sonny left the UK in January 2009, and it seemed he was never coming back. When he went to India, um, when they separated, she was really happy. He packed his bags and left. Her life's going to start. And it's going to start for the better and it's going to start again. The kids were going to school full time and she didn't have to rely on anyone. She had some stability, independence, and she was having fun. She was that bubbly girl that she was as a teenager. It was good to have Gita back. She signed the divorce petition on the 7th of September 2009 citing verbal abuse, accusations of infidelity and domestic violence. However, the same day, after a nine-month absence, Sonny unexpectedly returned from India. All of a sudden, he came back. And that kind of shocked us because he had said to her, like, I'm going, you know, I'm going to India for good. Sonny was back, and it seemed he did not want the marriage to end. He was careful not to reveal where he was staying so the divorce papers could not be served. And he had come up with his own theories as to why Gita wanted a divorce. Oi, come on, talking to you. Who are you? She's never going to leave me and she's never going to take my kids, do you understand? He'd been down to the radio station and speaking to her never. colleagues and accusing them of having an affair with Gita. He was convinced and he was paranoid that, that Gita was having an affair behind his back. Sonny befriended another member of staff of the radio station and asked him to find out whether Gita was having an affair and who she was having an affair with. That person was unable to find out anything against her. It was becoming clear Sonny had not come to terms with Gita's plans to divorce him. She was scared about being followed home. On one occasion, she actually told her friends that she'd been followed home from work. He was obsessed with her. That's what he was. To escape her problems, Gita went to India on the 26th of September. While she was away, Sonny went to her flat, looking for evidence that she had a lover. He hacked her email and Facebook account, but it didn't stop there. The telephone records show that he called Gita over 400 times in a couple of months, but she only called him twice. On one occasion, Sonny phoned Gita. She was in a restaurant. Um, and Sonny believed that she was having an affair and Gita had to hand the phone over uh, to a female work colleague to prove that actually, yeah, I'm having lunch with a work colleague. Uh, I'm not with a guy, I'm not having an affair. Just speak to him and just, just tell him you're with me. Hello? Every time the phone rang, it's almost like she was too scared to answer it. She was too scared to miss that call. And I don't know what he was saying to her, what, how he was threatening her. But something was scaring her, that he was saying. Anita found out just how scared Gita was when she joined her in India for a family wedding. 
He kept on ringing her and ringing her and harassing her. So I answered the phone and he goes, um, I know she's got a boyfriend and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill, kill him. him. And then I'm going to kill her. You know, my only regret is maybe putting pressure on her to go to the police, but I don't know what was stopping her. She was obviously quite scared, very scared. Things had become so strained between the couple that Gita wrote an ominous message on her Facebook page. I have never hated anyone in my life but you. I know she had spoken to my mum and she was like, you don't know, mum, he's gone more psycho. Gita was being stalked and harassed by her estranged husband, but was too scared to go to the police. However, as a busy working single mum, she had to persevere. On the 16th of November, 2009, she left work as usual. See you tomorrow, everyone. And travelled to nearby Bye. Greenford to collect her two boys from the childminders. But she would never reach her destination. That was the start of our nightmare that we're still living in. There were no eyewitnesses to the attack on Gita, just a scream heard by a 16-year-old girl doing her homework who thought nothing of it at the time. She was attacked from behind, brutally struck on the head. Her hand was cut off from her arm. Her, her right hand here was, was severed literally from between the, the, the finger and the thumb all the way down. Uh, towards her wrist area. That was the nature of her, her injuries as well as some very severe head injuries that evening. The first thing she would have known was horrendous pain. It was a brutal, nasty attack. Are you OK? Emergency ambulance, what's the problem? Tell me what's happened. It's done, it's gone quickly. OK, I need to find out what's going on. She is awake yeah. then, is she, is she yeah, breathing? Yeah, she's breathing, she's breathing, yeah. And she's bleeding from the head and her hand, is that correct? Yeah, both, yeah. And when police first arrived there, the scene was absolute carnage. You had poor Gita lying on the floor, being tended to by the police, by the ambulance service, and a fair few passers-by looking on, trying to do their best to help Gita and to wonder what on earth had happened there. And she was taken very swiftly by ambulance to, to Charing Cross Hospital. While Gita was rushed to hospital, police found her employment pass at the scene of the crime, and it was through this that they identified her and contacted her family. It was about 11 o'clock at night and we got a knock on the door. They woke um, my mum and dad up and was like, you know, you need to go to the hospital now, you need to go to the hospital now, because Gita's been hurt really badly and she's not going to make it during the night. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. It was so surreal. I, I just stood still, and the police took her. And we were still all in shock. Then we got the phone call. Um, I didn't believe it. Did not believe it. I thought there's got to be a mistake. As my mum says she went to the hospital and um, my sister was lying there with her eyes open. And she called out her name and just went, Gita, Gita, but. She passed away. Three and a half hours after the assault, Gita died. The brutal attack was now a murder investigation. And within hours of her death, the police had a prime suspect. It became quite clear that she had a, an acrimonious relationship with her estranged husband. But the police had to find Sonny first. We knew that he lived locally. We knew perhaps that he was staying on friends' floors, but we didn't actually have a firm address for him to begin with, and that's something we had to find pretty quickly. Less than 12 hours after Gita's murder, the trail led to a house inhabited by a group of men, mainly illegal immigrants, and it was thought that Sonny was staying there. 
because of the ferocious nature of the attack, we weren't going to take any chances. Um, it's fair to say we went in hard. We forced our way in and found a number of Asian men sleeping on uh, the floor, or on sofas, or on beds. We found six people, many of whom could have been sunny. Uh, decision was made to arrest all of them. And at the station, Harpreet Sunny Orlak was soon identified. He spoke about Gita, and he told us that how, yes, they'd had their problems like so many other couples, um, but he and Gita were both working together uh, to try and make a go of it. I do not understand why this has happened. The police's prime suspect was claiming that he would never hurt his wife. And more importantly, he claimed he could prove it. Sonny gave us an alibi uh, that he'd been in a pub with some friends that evening, playing pool, having a drink. Well, what are you having, lads? And he'd had a conversation with the barman. He also said there was CCTV in the pub. This would give him a cast iron alibi. Barman! It seemed Sonny had not murdered his wife. On the 16th of November 2009, 28-year-old Gita Orlak was attacked and killed on her way to collect her children from the childminders after she had finished work. It became clear quite soon that this wasn't a random attack. Only a handful of people would have known which way she went. Therefore, we had to look at those people and see whether they were involved in Gita's murder. The police knew Geeta's estranged husband, Harpreet, who went by the name Sonny, knew her movements. He was arrested the day after the murder on suspicion of killing his wife. But Sonny claimed he had an alibi. Sonny told us that he'd been in the old Elm Tree public house in Hounslow that evening. Um, he told us that he had spoken to the barman. He also knew that that pub had CCTV, and he also knew that one of his friends had paid for the drink on a credit card. The CCTV confirmed that he had been there on the previous evening. The barman also remembered a particular conversation he had with Sonny. Barman! Well, what are you having, lads? Nice place you got here. Thank you very much. You're the man. I am the most. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's alibi was confirmed and he was released. But on the same day he'd been arrested, a witness had come forward. The guy walked into Southall Police Station, gave his name as Jaswant Singh Dillon. He told us that he was there on the evening. Yes, sir. I'm just one thing, Dylan. I need to talk to someone. What is this concerning, sir? I just went with them. I didn't know what they were going to do. Jaswant Dylan told the police he'd agreed to travel by car the night before with two acquaintances to collect a bad debt. Instead, he'd unwittingly become involved in the murder. He had been picked up in a car by two other men, had been driven to the location where the attack happened. He got outside the car with another man that shed a cigarette, uh, this other man had gone off. Uh, Jasmine Singh done, so he then got back in the car. A Couple of minutes later, the, the chap came back, running back to the car, got back in, and he had a, a machete-style object with him. Uh, and this chap said, I killed the sister bitch. But according to Jaswant Dillon, events did not end there. Dylan told us that as soon as the other man had come back into the car, the car had driven off, they'd come to a housing estate in Slough, uh, where a canal was running through it. And the three of them then got out of the car, walked towards the canal, um, and they'd thrown a machete uh, and also a jacket into the canal. The information was, in theory, going to lead detectives directly to the location of the murder weapon and the blood-soaked top worn by the man who had attacked Gita. They then took the M4 towards London. The car then pulled onto the hard shoulder. Uh, the rear seat passenger uh, threw his trainers uh, into the undergrowth there. They then rejoined the M4 and drove in towards Southall, where Jaswan was dropped off. Less than 24 hours after the attack, Police appeared to have a full account of what had happened on the night of Geeta's murder, as long as Jaswant Dillon was telling the truth. The police immediately went to the locations Jaswant described to see if they could uncover the machete, trainers and jacket. And Jaswant continued to talk, giving the police a name. It was the name of the man who had driven him and the killer to the murder scene that night. The nickname uh, that he gave us was that of the driver. It was a nickname of Savak Sala, which we later find out actually means the brother-in-law of Gusavak, and that became very important. 
but Jaswant also gave the police another name. It was the name of the man who returned to the car with the machete. The name of the man who he believed had murdered Gita. The person he identified as having killed Gita, a chap called Sher Singh. The police had initially suspected Sonny, but his alibi had proven he didn't kill his wife. Now the police had been given the name and address of a young man accused of Gita's murder. At 5.30 a.m. on the 19th November, we went to the address we believe Sher Singh was. Police! Sher Singh! Sher Singh! Sher Singh! When we went inside the house, uh, there were five people inside, any one of which could have been the Sher Singh character. Uh, so I made, I made a decision to arrest all five of them. The men were taken to Southall Police Station to be identified and questioned. Jaswant Dillon was proving to be a reliable witness, and his help continued to provide breakthroughs. On the same day, the search teams who had been searching the canal found a tracksuit top. That top was checked for blood, and it was confirmed there was blood on it. It was therefore fairly obvious to us that this would have been a jacket identified by Jaswant Singh as being worn by the killer. This potentially valuable piece of evidence was taken to be tested for any DNA traces to see if it connected Sher Singh to Gita. And the police's good fortune on the 19th of November continued back at Sher Singh's home. We then left that address in order to go to the police station to confirm whether we'd arrested Sher Singh already. We also left a police officer there, and it was whilst this police officer was there uh, that the real Sher Singh walked in through the front door with his own key, identified himself, and he was arrested straight away. Now in custody, the police began to try and unravel the mystery surrounding the murder suspect. Sher Singh was 18 years of age, and he said that he hadn't been in the country very long, having come from India. When Sher Singh was interviewed, um, he didn't answer any of our questions. Um, he gave no comment reply throughout, whether that was through his own decisions or whether it was through legal advice, but he didn't answer any of our questions. But their witness, Jaswant Dillon, could confirm they had the right man. He was put in identity parade, um, and he was identified by Jaswant Singh Dillon uh, as the person that came back into the car with this machete saying, I killed the sister bitch. Jaswant was proving vital to the investigation. Everything he had described turned out to be true. And when the DNA analysis of the jacket was complete, it confirmed Sher Singh was the man who had brutally murdered Geeta. We had what's called wearer DNA for Sher Singh on it. That means DNA that's either from around the collar or, or the cuffs. Uh, that related to Sher Singh. Crucially, we also had DNA and hairs in there that related to, to Gita. The forensic tests proved that the teenager was involved in Gita's death. And on the 21st of November, thanks to Jaswant Dillon's help, another discovery was made. The trainers he had described were found in the location where he had remembered them being dumped. DNA analysis once again showed they were Sher Singh's. Five days after her death, Sher Singh was charged with Geeta's murder and remanded in custody. I want to ask him how would he feel if it was his sister? What did you get out of hitting an innocent girl over the head four times with a machete? What did you get out of it? How did you feel when you were doing it? Geeta's killer was now in custody and the following day the police uncovered the weapon he used to kill her. On the 22nd of November, we found a machete in the canal. That machete had been sharpened and hadn't been in the canal very long. It was taken for a forensic examination, but due to the time it had been in the canal, all the blood and DNA and fingerprints had been washed off it. Jaswant Singh Dillon had been instrumental in catching Geeta's killer. Jaswant's description of what happened, where the machete was, where the jacket was, where the shoes were, and his description of what happened at the scene were now matching what we knew to be true. He was a very important witness for us. The police had their killer, but something about the crime just didn't add up. This didn't appear to be a random murder. Uh, it didn't appear to be a robbery that had gone wrong. There didn't seem to be any reason at that time for Sher Singh to have killed, killed Gita. Why had the teenage boy viciously attacked a total stranger? The police began to investigate Sher Singh's background to try and uncover a hidden motive. Uh, he'd come over to the UK in July 2009 on a Tier 4 student visa. Uh, this is one of these visas where you come to the country to study, to enrol in a college course. Uh, we quickly identified through the college that he turned up day one 
and then he disappeared. He never started again. The teenager was part of an immigration scam, but nothing connected him to Gita. Yet the attack was not random. When we looked into Gita's movements immediately before her killing, we knew that she'd left Sunrise Radio about 20 past six. We knew that she'd got onto 105 bus, and we had CCTV of that, um, and that she got off at a bus stop. Bearing in mind it's about seven o'clock in a November evening, it's, it's dark. She, understandably for a, a single woman, has got off at a bus stop that's quite well lit on the main road. Uh, and then she's walked, not the shortest, but perhaps the most well lit route to the childminders. Um, and so we thought that somebody had either been watching her or somebody is very familiar with her movements. The police began to consider that if the killer didn't have a motive for murder, perhaps somebody else did. It was believed this person had been given information and requested to attack Gita Orlacchia in the street on that day at that place. Detectives suspected that Sher Singh had been instructed by someone else to kill Gita, and that theory led the police back to their initial suspect. We've got no link between Sher Singh and Gita. The common denominator here is Sonny. He had been in the pub and who he had been in the pub with. We therefore needed to find out to see if there were links between them which would, may have resulted in Sonny asking Sher Singh to kill his wife. If Sonny was involved, he had carefully covered his tracks, but the police discovered tentative links between the two men. When we looked at Sher Singh, uh, we found out where he first stayed when he came into the UK. We realised that the actual address where he was living was an address that was rented to Sonny's brother. There we had our first real link between the two. Uh, the second link came is when we had a look at exactly where these two individuals were from in India. And if you look at the whole of India, they, these, these two guys, Sher Singh and Sonny, lived perhaps a mile and a half apart in a small farming community deep in the Punjab. These discoveries implied a connection, but another breakthrough almost confirmed it. Sonny was involved in the Tier 4 scam, which was how Sher Singh had entered the UK. When these young lads came over from India, he would get them work, he would get them accommodation, he would look after them. These guys were indebted to him, owed him a, a sense of gratitude and, and favour. The police had always suspected Sonny's involvement in his wife's death, and these coincidences implied a friendship between Geeta's killer and her estranged husband, which led the police to consider Sher Singh's motive for murder. Could he have killed Geeta in the name of honour? Honour killing is the term that is applied uh, to somebody who is killed because they brought shame upon their family or their community. I was of the opinion very early on that this was not a killing. She was looking to further her life away from her husband. And we believe that she was probably killed because, if you like, she was bringing shame upon him. Could Sonny have ordered his wife's execution? Most honour killings are carried out by a member of the dishonoured family and the two men were not related. But the police then uncovered a piece of evidence that revealed the men's families in India were very close. We obtained the wedding video of Sonny's brother that had occurred earlier that year in the Punjab. Shown on the wedding video is Sonny and Sonny's family, but also amongst the gathering was Cher. Uh, in the wedding video you see him dancing uh, with Sonny's brother, you see him dance with Sonny's mother. He's, he's closely involved uh, with Sonny and Sonny's family. But a misplaced sense of loyalty may not have been the sole motivation for murder. A witness who lived at the same address as Sher Singh revealed a disturbing incident that happened just a month before the murder. Sonny had been at the house, where he'd made quite a candid offer to all the housemates that are there that he would give £5,000 to anybody that would kill somebody for him. Simple enough job. All you have to do is kill someone for me. <laughs> you should see your faces, man. I'm joking. Joking aside, unemployed Sonny had enough cash to back up his offer. We'd identified a fraud that he'd committed in relation to the purchase of a car. We knew he had the £5,000 available at the time of the offer. So he was able to fund an attack on his wife at that price. Sher Singh was present when the offer was made, and a month later, Geeta was tragically dead. 
but all this evidence was circumstantial, the police turned their attention back to the murder weapon to see if it offered any more definitive answers. What we really need to do was trace this machete and find out who had bought it and where they'd bought it and what was their involvement in, in Geeta's murder. Through the serial number, the police traced the murder weapon back to a shop in West London and they had captured a man purchasing the murder weapon on their CCTV cameras. On this disc is a CCTV from the shop in Hounslow where the machete was purchased. It was of great importance to our investigation. The police couldn't believe their eyes when they viewed the CCTV footage. It was the key to understanding why Gita had been killed and if her husband had been responsible. On the 16th of November 2009, 28-year-old Gita Orlak was violently murdered on her way to collect her sons from their babysitters after work. <coughs> DNA evidence confirmed the killer was a teenager who had recently come to the UK from the Punjab in India. He had killed the mother of two with a machete. The police had recovered the murder weapon from a canal and traced it back to the shop where it had been purchased. That, in turn, led to the police examining CCTV footage and they found themselves staring at the man who bought the murder weapon, a face that was all too familiar. We saw Sonny buying the machete. We got you. The CCTV revealed a telling picture from within the shop. So the importance was premeditation. He's buying the killing weapon five days, one and a half hours before it was used. Uh, you can see his hand running along the blade, feeling the tip of the blade. He's not looking at it as if it was something that he was going to put on the wall of his house. He's looking at it as a weapon. We do know he asked about how to sharpen it. And what we saw later on in the knife that we found in the canal was it had been sharpened. You describe it as a eureka moment. You suddenly go, that's it. We've got enough to convict him now. We don't have to rely on circumstantial evidence. So we've got hard facts now. Although there were still questions to be answered, the CCTV footage was vital in establishing what the police had always suspected, that Sonny was behind the plot to kill his estranged wife. He was re-arrested on the 11th of December 2009. Sonny still claimed he was innocent. I don't know why Shesi would have murdered Gita. But the police knew exactly how involved Sonny was in his wife Gita's murder. Sonny was the mastermind of this offence. He arranged the people to do the jobs he wanted them to. He offered them money to do so. He told them where Gita was going to be and when she was going to be there. He clearly knew in advance what was going to happen to her. Sonny, whose full name is Harpreet Orlak, was charged with the murder of his wife on the 12th of December 2009, less than a month after her death. When we actually went to charge him with his wife's murder, um, very strange reaction. He was grinning, he was smirking, he was laughing, he was joking. Um, very strange to see. But while the police had charged Sonny for masterminding his wife's murder, along with her killer, Cher Singh, there was still the elusive driver who the police had been unable to track down, despite the help of Jaswant Dillon. Jaswant had claimed to have unwittingly found himself with the other two men on the night of the murder. We knew three things about the driver. Jaswant Dillon had told us his nickname, Savak Sala, the brother-in-law of Savak. We knew he was driving a small black car and we knew his phone number. We went through the phone records for his phone and identified a family in Slough. We then looked at that family and identified a younger son. We formulated a plan uh, one morning, very early in the morning. Um, we arrest him just as he's getting into his car. Uh, his name was Harpreet Singh. Harpreet Singh! Harpreet Singh! You're under arrest. Harpreet Singh was 19 years old and he was the brother-in-law of Savak, so he was also known by the name Savak Sala which was the name given to the police by their key witness, Jaswant Dillon. Detectives had found the final person involved in Geeta's murder, the mysterious driver. On the following day, Harpreet Singh was charged with the murder of Geeta Orlak. The police had the final piece of the puzzle, or so they thought. Looking at the roles of who was involved in Geeta's murder, we had Sher Singh, who we're saying, yes, you're the attacker. We now had the driver, uh, Savak Sala or Harpreet Singh. Uh, we felt like he was the, the, the driver behind this. Uh, but we had no information that either of those two individuals knew Gita. So we had to have somebody there 
who could identify her to the killer on the street. And that's when everything kind of fell into place. And we thought, yeah, this is Jaswan Singh Dillon. The police started to believe that their key witness, Jaswant Dillon, was not the innocent bystander he had portrayed himself to be. His phone records had revealed to them he was good friends with Sonny, Geeta's husband. He had lied, and they suspected he was integral to the vicious murder. We now believed his role was central. He'd been sent with these much younger, much more naive young men in order to ensure that they did what Sonny had asked for. The fact he was out of the car, close to the murder scene at a particular time, under his own admissions, as much as anybody else, was indicative that maybe he even pointed out the victim to Sher Singh. So his role was important. He had been told by Sonny what to do, and he made certain it happened. Jaswant Singh Dillon was the fourth conspirator charged with the murder of Geeta Orlak. And to seal the quartet's fate further, detailed analysis of their phone records revealed just how premeditated and planned the murder was. Crucially, when we looked at Sonny's phone, we, it was quite clear that he'd been in contact with Sher Singh, he'd been in contact with Harpreet Singh, and he'd been in contact with Jaswant Singh Dillon in the days and weeks leading up to Geeta's murder. The important thing was, towards the night of the murder, it was building up. You saw more contact between them. And then after the murder, you saw there was sharp reduction in contact. The telephone records not only showed that the four men had meticulously planned the murder, but the police were also able to use the four mobile phones to pinpoint their locations at specific times. It was quite clear to us that uh, Jaswant Singh Dillon, Sher Singh, Harpreet Singh, and quite probably Sher Singh, uh, we're all together at a meeting in, in, in Slough on the 21st of October. This is now three weeks before Geeta's being killed. No one knows what was discussed at that meeting, but less than a month later, Geeta was dead. The phone activity also pinpointed another meeting just four days before the murder. On the 12th of November, while Sonny removed himself from the area, the three other men travelled to what would become the murder scene. The main protagonist that we're saying involved in Geeta's murder are there in and around the Greenford area, perhaps we're saying to do a dry run for events that would then happen on the 16th. The 12th of November was either a rehearsal or an aborted murder attempt. No one will ever know. Four days later, on the night of the murder, the phone records revealed even more damning evidence. There was communication between Sonny and the driver. There was communication between the driver and Jaswant Dillon and also the communication between the driver and Sher Singh. So it looked to us like they were gathering to go off and commit the offence. We then looked at the movements of the phones, and what we've got is that we can trace the movements from each of their home addresses to the scene. They're at the scene for a period of about an hour, sitting on that same area for that period of time. At 7.04 p.m., there's 999 calls made to police by a member of the public. If we look at the phone calls shortly before then, then we see communication between Sonny and the driver of the vehicle. Yes, he was definitely at the pub at the time Geeta was killed. Um, it was also quite clear that he was receiving telephone calls. Those phone calls between Sonny and the driver of the car were clearly telling Sonny that whatever plan they had in place to kill her or severely injure her had taken place. Hello, is it done? The mobile phone information cemented the relationship between the four seemingly unconnected men and revealed the intricate planning that went into killing Sonny's wife. And in October 2010, almost a year after Geeta's brutal murder, the four men stood trial at the Old Bailey. They all pleaded not guilty. OK, one of my memories of the, the trial was seeing Sonny. Um, he was blowing kisses into the public gallery, which is where Geeta's immediate family were. He was taunting them. They had no remorse in court. They were shaking each other's hand, smiling at each other. Vultures. This is a man who's killed the woman that he apparently loved. And he's deprived uh, the Shin family um, of, of, of their daughter and of their sister. Um, Horrible man. It's almost like he's smiling at us, you know, that I've won because I've taken her. At the trial, the police presented a compelling account of what happened.
the jury unanimously found Sonny, whose full name is Harpreet Orlak, guilty of the murder of his wife. He was jailed for life to serve a minimum of 28 years. The other three, Cher Singh, the killer, Jaswant Dillon, the lookout, and Harpreet Singh, the driver, were all sentenced to life imprisonment for a minimum of 22 years. It was just the fact that she was leaving him. And he just could not, could not take it. Hence, he got her murdered. Um, simple as. There was no honor to it. After the devastating loss of Gita, the pain is still felt by the many people who loved her. She's tremendously missed. They've taken someone's mother, they've taken someone's daughter, they've taken someone's sister, friend away. And we'll have to live with the pain for the rest of our lives. <laughs>